My name is Hermann Hages. I'm the executive director of Uber Austria. And this panel discussion is part of our 70 years of Bright Mind celebration. So it's great that you join that. And um, I just want to give you a bit of a background. In 1950, Fulbert Austria was founded. And then one year later, the first ships crossed the ocean. So Austrian Fulbrighters and US Fulbrighters on their ship um, set out on their journey. And in addition to this program, which now um, is in its seventh year for Austria, Fulbright Austria also um, administrates the US teaching assistantship program on behalf of the Federal Ministry for Education, Science and Research. So on behalf of the Federal Min Ministry of, in Austria here, I also want to say welcome to everybody. And we have stakeholders from the entire program here, which will then uh, jump into the panel discussion and give us the chance to ask questions and discuss the program. So the US Teaching Assistantship Program is very special. It's very unique because it's, it, bring, it brings US citizens into the Austrian classroom. So thereby US teaching assistants in a classroom together with, with uh, Austrian teachers uh, improve the, the language skills of Austrian students in the classroom. And in addition to that, also bring and improve cultural understanding and intercultural cultural dialogue in the Austrian classroom. So it's wonderful that we have uh, representatives of the ministry today here uh, who are funding the program. We also have um, representatives from the US embassy here. We have representatives from the schools here. So school director as well as teachers. And in addition to that, we also have US teaching assistants here who teach in the Austrian classroom and the student from an Austrian school. So this is what we have here for you to join in. Uh, there's a wonderful opportunity to ask questions after the, after the discussion. And uh, with this, I would like to hand it back uh, so that we can do what Fulbright Austria is doing to promote cultural understanding and dialogue between the US and Austria. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to ask everybody in, on the panel uh, to just say in a few quick words uh, what uh, he or she is, uh, is and what, uh, what uh, everybody's background is, just to get an idea. Uh, may I start uh, with um, uh, Mrs. Hüttner? Hello, I'm Mrs. Hüttner, and uh, I've been teaching for more than, well, nearly 40 years, and I retired on last, in last month. Uh, I used to teach English and German, and I always had language assistants, and uh, it was always a very good thing to work with them because they enrich the lives of the teachers and they become friends. I'm still befriended with Mitch, for example, others as well, and um, the students love them. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Neuhäuser, can you give me a quick introduction? Yes, um, hello. Um, I am with the uh, Austrian Federal Ministry of Education, Science and Research since um, 1992. Always been inter in international cooperation. I used to be in um, a research cooperation. So I'm just um, going through my papers this afternoon. I just stumbled across this paper here. I think I wrote in 1993 for the ministry. Um, the state of affairs of um, uh, SNT relationships and cultural relationships between Austria and the United States, 1993, so almost 30 years ago. So I've been in this job for quite, a, for quite some time. Well, and I'm looking forward to this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Gilmore. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Alison Gilmore, and I am a current U.S. teaching assistant currently living in Linz, Austria. I am originally from St. Louis, Missouri, and I went to college at North Carolina A&T State University, where I actually received a degree in journalism and mass communications. So Mikhail, we have something in common there. Um, and I actually wrapped up my last day of work yesterday, 
And I am so excited to be teaching for a second year also in Linz, Austria. Wonderful. Uh, Mrs. Mills. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure and an honor to, to be here. I'm the public affairs officer at the US Embassy and I have the honor of serving on the Fulbright board. Uh, Fulbright means so much to Austria-America relations. Um, as um, was already said, we're celebrating 70 years and the teaching part is, um, is such a personal part because communication starts with language. And I know that from personal experience, I gr grew up um, speaking German. I went to a German school for one year. Uh, French, I learned later, and it was a lot more difficult. So um, in terms of both teaching, learning, and experiencing other cultures, um, there's nothing better than a program like this one. And I'm looking forward to also hearing from all of the participants and uh, for those of you who are going to have questions for us later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ellis. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Yeah, my name is Ben Ellis. I have just wrapped up my second year teaching in Voisberg in Carinthia, Austria. Um, and yeah, so it's a pleasure to be here and be able to give you guys hopefully a bit of an idea of what we USTAs do. Um, shout out to my fellow Midwesterner, Allison. Good to see that kind of representation, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, I personally just think that a lot of our job is to sort of make, you know, America and make English a living reality for the kids in the classroom. And yeah, it's I'm sad to see it be come to an end, but it's been awesome. So, yeah. Uh, Mrs. Snager. Hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Nika Nikita. Um, I am a high school student uh, in the my school my high school was in the middle of Graz where uh, I went to a class which specified in the foreign languages so I'm super happy to represent um, from a student's point of view. And Mr. Fleck. Good evening everybody. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for the organization. I'm a director from a school in Vienna. Anton Kriegergasse. I've been teaching myself for over 20 years now and I'm still teaching physics and biology, not languages, but I've always been uh, also been working at the university in research where language and international communication and um, connections is a very important part. So I think this is something that should be um, uh, should be made to feel it's cool as well. And therefore I'm very happy to be here. And yeah, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Uh, thanks a lot. I'll also introduce myself quickly. My name is Michael Huber. I'm a journalist for Courier and um, I was a Fulbright student at Columbia University in the year of uh, 2007, six, seven, uh, the 6 7 academic year. Uh, and uh, I attended their master's program for uh, journalism at the journalism school with a focus of arts and on arts and culture journalism. Right. Um, so, uh, to, just to get a little bit more of a feel um, what it is like to have a USTA in an Austrian classroom. Mrs. Smager, can you just talk uh, about your experiences, uh, which, uh, at which age or at which stage in the school process did you first encounter um, um, a, a teaching, a U.S. teaching assistant, and, uh, and how was the experience? Yeah, so um, you have in your Unterstufe, um, you have a few lessons with a, a U.S. teaching assistant, at least it was uh, like at my school, but you really start benefiting in the age from uh, around 15 to 18, so when the U.S. high school start, or starts, um, and uh, this has been very, very valuable in many ways because I feel like um, each U.S. assistant just brings a not so small bit of U.S. culture into each classroom um, and it opens up deep dialogues between um, the student and the teaching assistant to uh, discover both similarities and differences between uh, the U.S. and the Austrian culture um, and um, the teaching assistants just create a very safe atmosphere, I think, for us students to um, where we are encouraged to learn 
I hope I pronounce it correctly, reciprocally, um, it, from the comfort of our classrooms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what what did your did, did you have um, numerous teaching assistants or or, or uh, same the same person for like two or three years or? Uh, I had I had a teacher for two years and then uh, a teaching assistant for two years and then she left our school and then I had another one. Right, right. So when you say they bring American culture into the classroom, what exactly do you mean? Uh, all of it. We have uh, with the teaching assistant, they um, have the insight into how political, social and um, um, I guess the approaches that the U.S. takes to uh, all the issues and they um, give, uh, give us the insight to um, what life looks like in the U.S. Okay, Mr. Ellis, what are the kinds of discussions that you were um, having with your students um, or the, the kinds of discussions that you basically instigated? Um. Well, first of all, I'd like to really appreciate what Nikita said about reciprocity, that shared kind of back and forth, like, because as teachers, we definitely learn from the Austrian kids we're in the classroom with. Um, regarding, like, the discussions that we have, you know, um, yeah, a lot of the time, especially some of the older classes, we would get into talking about, you know, particularly current events. Since I've been here for two years, you know, we've watched the whole process of the presidential election the debates, and then, of course, you know, everything that followed with that. So, you know, that's given us a chance in the classroom to kind of talk about what are the big issues, you know, um, which for me starts with establishing what are the kids familiar with um, and letting them have a time and a place to ask questions about what's going on and sort of, you know, get, you know, I, I like that I've had the freedom to offer my kind of transparency and my take on things as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, I have a background in political science um, from my undergrad um, bachelor's degree. So I definitely enjoy those conversations, but um, we get into other aspects of our cultural kind of background. And, uh, you know, you know I, I love, for example, the national parks in the US. And so for me, sometimes those classroom discussions and those projects that we work on feature kind of discovering a unique aspect of America, like um, the parks or something that you could visit and see that is maybe overlooked um, sometimes. So yeah, just the, the opportunity to kind of dig in deeper in conversation has been awesome. Right, right. Uh, Mrs. Gilmer, what, what has been your experience so far in uh, what have the students given you and uh, uh, how has this reciprocity played out? Absolutely. Um, I think one of my favorite subjects is food, honestly, because, you know, it's so easy to just show pictures of American fast food and all these American snacks and treats. So I'm looking forward to bringing back my students all these Rice Krispie treats and fruit roll ups and all these amazing things that they can't find at the American candy store. And of course, they suggest to me, oh, try Kaiser Schmann, you have to eat Kaiser Spetzla, just all these Austrian specialties that you don't necessarily learn in a German classroom. You know, in a German classroom, you focus on maybe more of Germany, you get a little bit of Austria, but really digging into Austrian culture, I think has been really interesting. And also being able to present my students with a different form of American culture and also still having very deep social conversations while also throwing in a bit of fun has been an absolutely amazing experience for me. Right, right, right. Food is, I think, always an, an icebreaker in, in a way. <laughs> Um, how has uh, how much of this is uh, and probably please everybody on the panel uh, please chime in if you have anything to say I don't really want to uh, go through one by one or uh, not necessarily um, but how much of that uh, is happening inside the classroom and what is happening outside the classroom how, how would you um, balance this I could add a little bit on the note of food and other activities. Um, well, so I would add towards the end, of course, you know, since I'm heading out, I'm done with my contracts. Uh, we've had the opportunity to have sort of a 
corona conform kind of uh, picnic outside, an American picnic with some of my classes, um, which of course featured, you know, American foods. I made my grandma's uh, American style potato salad, which is, you know, a recipe that, you know, potato salad, you know, Arepso salad is just something that, you know, both of our cultures have, um, but of course in different versions. So we've been able to kind of enjoy those things. And um, I think of course the pandemic has impacted, you know, what we can and can't do in terms of interacting outside of the classroom. Um, but yeah, there was prior to the pandemic, there were, you know, around the holidays, you know, I would definitely be bringing some different baked goods and cookies and stuff for the students to try, um, like different recipes and things like that. That um, I know, for example, some of the schools, like I've taught at a high bay where they have teaching uh, cooking classes. Um, and so some of those recipes that I've introduced them to pumpkin bread in the fall, or some different Christmas cookies. Those recipes have also go, gone down in Austrian uh, school cookbooks as well. So, right. I mean, yeah, food can facilitate a lot of that conversation. <clears throat> absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I, I want to just briefly jump to the more organizational uh, aspect of it. Um, Mrs. Mose, um, the, the, the uh, mutual understanding, that's the phrase that uh, basically Fulbright in all of its um, facets is, is built around. Um, in terms of um, uh, promoting mutual understanding, what are the goals that are defined uh, from the organizational side? What uh, is the thing that should be achieved in such a year and uh, through experience li experiences like the ones we just uh, heard described? Well, in a very broad way, uh, it, mutual understanding means that we don't necessarily agree on everything, but that we learn about each other. And especially in the U.S. Teaching Assistant Program, where we're, um, you know, working with, uh, you know, we, we often think of the Fulbright Program uh, as being very specialized for scholars, and it does that as well. But learning starts early, and it continues um, throughout our lives. So. Um, you know, being exposed um, the way that's already been described in a, in a more personal way, being able to move from subject to subject, concentrating on the language, which of course opens up um, all kinds of avenues for exploring uh, each other's countries and each other's cultures and news and organizations and NGOs. Um, that's what it's all about. And I think this program is, is, is special because there's so much give and take on both sides. The, the students learn and, you know, those coming from the United States um, to teach here, they're not just teaching, as we've already heard, they're learning as well. So this is um, a win-win program for, for everybody that lasts a lifetime. All right, right. Uh, Mr. Neuhäuser, can you uh, give me a little bit more of an... Uh, idea of how the USTA programs figures uh, in the whole gamut of, um, of activities that are meant to promote a mutual understanding between the US and, and Austria. You're muted, I think. Please turn on your... Turn on. Yeah, now. thank you. Uh, well, um, the... the um... Uh, language assistance programs with for the United States started up as a very small program in 1952. I think the first changes took place, so it was a very small program at the beginning. Um, but as you see, um, uh, international cooperation is something that is uh, very long term. So it, um, it's, it's like it's like um, um, growing a small plant, you know, and then and, and taking care of it. So it's so, so, so it develops um, very slowly. And, um, and this program has developed into, uh, into a um, substantial program over the years. And um, up to the very day, we have a great demand for um, 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 teaching assistance from the United States. So in fact, we could employ at least double. So we have 140 assistants coming to, the, to Austria every year, which is the highest number of assistants. We have about 400 per year coming from different countries, but 140 are from the United States only. Uh, so it's, um, um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a budget question, of course. So, we, it's, um, so we, we, we pay um, 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 a teacher's salary for the assistance. And so um, 
it's it's quite quite it's quite hard to, to, to get more people coming into the program but it's um um, on the school level, it's um, um, the most important program we have with the United States um, in general. Um, and, and the benefit, of course, uh, for both sides is, um, as was already mentioned, um, is, is uh, uh, for the, for the um, well, for us, for instance, for us in Austria, when uh, American US uh, teaching assistants come to Austria, they are, of course, ambassadors for US culture. But when they go back home, they keep Austria on their minds, so um, they 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 kind of uh, yeah um, 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 have an aspect of an Austrian ambassador back home. I hope so. Um, I, I made this experience myself because I was also in exchange programs. Um, um, we have an exchange program for civil servants, so I spent a couple of months in Finland at the education ministry, and so. I, I grew into this and then and, 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 and there are lots of relations with Finland. I spent half a year in the United States in Washington, DC and organizing our <clears throat> researchers network at the Austrian embassy. And so living there um, um, changed um, the whole perception of the United States and um, Austrians going to American schools. Uh, when they return back home, um, it's also quite interesting because um, um, they, um, will convey a different picture of US culture because we have lots of cliches in Austria. Uh, about, uh, about the way Austrians think Americans are, behave, and then and, and the, the whole country works. But um, when these people come back from, from the United States, um, they, they can very, convey a very differentiated um, picture and, um, and, uh, and uh, away from these cliches. Right, right, right. Um, in, in the practical sense, um, how uh, can I imagine the balance between the, the cultural exchange that happens just by talking about specific topics uh, on, in, in the classroom and outside of it and the whole language um, aspect of it? Uh, Mrs. Hübner, uh, how, uh, what are USTAs required to do in the classroom and uh, uh, how can you imagine uh, how they are, are they being prepared? Can you give us a, a little overview? Well, depending on which, in which class they're supposed to be, um, they have different requirements to meet, meaning that if they are teaching um, in our school, it was uh, from the third year on that we had language assistance and um, they, that was basic vocabulary, bribing them with food and things like this to make them. And they're really interested. The kids loved that. Yeah. So we had breakfast mornings uh, where the kids brought something and the assistant brought something and we had a nice meal, et cetera, et cetera. The older the kids get, um, the more difficult it is because uh, some uh, the students need to know a lot about politics because also, uh, my classes used to be interested in politics and uh, it is uh, American uh, voting system, for example, is difficult to explain. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and uh, it, yeah, it needs help from the teacher as well. If we do that in the seventh form. And um, we also, um, um, well, I, I usually organize discussion groups. So with the older ones, uh, uh, they had a topic. I told, we, we discussed it beforehand, what was to be said and what vocabulary was important, et cetera, et cetera. And then they had the discussion and left the classroom and I worked with a group of five and then I worked with the rest and then we swapped. And it was really good. And um, yeah, and most of uh, the students I know were excellent in that discussion. Mm -hmm. And the children really, uh, the students really liked it. They, they learned a lot from it, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. language-wise. Right, right, right. Uh, Mr. Fleck, uh, probably you can also add your perspective. Um, I, I, I read that your school puts a really strong focus on uh, including everybody, not having uh, having barriers for people not to be able to participate in the 
um, uh, in, in the process of education. But I can imagine that uh, especially different levels uh, in English may be, pose a barrier for uh, students to participate in the good things that USTAs might bring them. Well, pose a barrier. In fact, I mean, my school and many schools are all about diversity. You know, like cultural diversity, social diversity, um, well, all kinds of diversity, which is a good thing, actually, because that's our society. That's how the world is. And we have a lot of students from different countries, like students who were born in Austria but have background in other countries and students who came to Austria. Um, so the German language is not necessarily um, a unification for them. I mean, they all speak German, but it is a native language. However, all of them start learning English when they start in our school. So that's some point where they're all at the same level, which is a very important thing. We have students from abroad, um, sometimes refugees, who are not good at German at all, but they are good in English. So English actually helps keeping these the students together. And it's a very strong point because we have students who are not so good in German and therefore maybe not so good at math because they don't understand the text in math, but they're good in English. Mm -hmm. And the students, the teaching students, USTA, they help to show them that English is not just a subject at school, but something that is really spoken outside. I mean, in my opinion, it's a bit hypocritical, actually, that uh, English teachers or language teachers are Austrians. You know what I mean? All the teachers outside, please don't take this as an insult. No, no offense, man. But actually, a language should be taught by somebody who's native in his language and as a teacher, of course. So I think it's very, very important to have language assistance alongside the Austrian teaching. Right, right, right. Uh, Alison, um, Mrs. Gilmer? Well, I'll let Ben go first because his hand was up a bit longer than mine. Ben, you can go. Uh, first. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, that's, yeah, that, that's nice of you. Thank you, Alison. I was just going to kind of piggyback off of uh, what Director Flick uh, said. I absolutely have had students where that's been the situation, kids from, say, Croatia, or I've also taught in the southern part of Corinthia, where a lot of my students are also of a uh, like Corinthian Slovene background. Um, and I've had uh, students who were either new, their families had recently moved to Austria, um, where English lessons, given the lesson the day spent with the USTA is different than a standard English class, um, that gives them sometimes the opportunity to sort of shine, to speak up more. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think for me, that was really fulfilling to notice that, pick up on it, and also give them a chance just to talk and kind of be heard um, amongst their classmates. Um, I know during the pandemic, the, the lockdown period where we were online doing distance learning, uh, that really restricted a lot of quality interactions that we could have had, I would think. However, one that stands out for me was a student of, uh, you know, from a Muslim family who, you know, in a second year class who started um, really talking and exchanging and, and uh, answering questions and sharing with her classmates about her, um, you know, family's religious and traditional kind of holiday celebrations and that sort of thing, all happening in English. Um, and it was actually kind of a point where like, you know, like I was not teaching, I was listening you know, and, and this one student was really comfortable to talk and share about it. And I don't know, I thought that was particularly awesome. Um, so I've made it my job to kind of, you know, look for opportunities to give kids, you know, especially those who maybe don't talk as much, a chance to sort of feel comfortable in an English class in particular. Uh, Mr. Argis, I think it was your hand up there. Alison, maybe you want to start first because I think you were also there. Yeah, um, I just want to share the same sentiment as Ben and Mr. Fleck. I attend also a very diverse school and um, even more than getting the students to shine, but to also making them feel comfortable. I think Nikita touched on the point of making sure that the classroom is a safe space. So similar to Ben, I have a classroom with 
um, Muslim students and Orthodox students and, you know, Catholic and, and Protestant students and, you know, being able to have these conversations around the Easter holidays and how, you know, the Ramadan, the students who observe Ramadan, how they celebrate. And, you know, the, the same thing as Mr. Fleck is saying, that even these students who German may not be the strongest, or, you know, they may be coming into English at a different level. These students are experiencing a level of comfortability because we're having this cultural immersion sharing opportunity. And it just, it creates this really beautiful classroom environment. And I think that has stood out the most during this program. Mm -hmm. So I think it's uh, Mr. Agis and then Mrs. Uh, Smager. Yeah, thank you. So what for me shines through that all is that this personal interaction is so important, which is established in this kind of um, educational setups we have on, uh, and we thank for that. Um, the ministry in Austria was funding this uh, wonderful USDA program, as well as all this other teaching assistantship program of which the USDA program is a part of. In addition to our Fulbright programs we have and manage, this is an outstanding bigger program because in the classroom, the, in these USTAs, as you here in, in the panel know that, and, and the Austrian teachers, the team up in this kind of a, like a superhero team in the classroom, getting this interaction going in the classroom with the students to, and something new happens, which would not normally happen because two people, one from Austria and one from the United States come together in the classroom to establish this relationship. I think thereby it serves somehow as a model, also what uh, Fulbert Austria as a Fulbert program managing commission is doing to bring people on one table and the language is just a tool to, to motivate this cultural in interaction in the classroom. So I want to just use the opportunity to thank the USDAs here, as well as the teachers, because you are the superhero team in the classroom uh, creating these opportunities. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mrs. Zmager, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to add, uh, my classmates and I have had the discussion multiple times that English has somehow become the uh, language we're most comfortable talking about our emotions. Um, because with German, we somehow uh, associate productivity and uh, school and stress. Whereas with English, we're more allowed to talk about our, uh, yeah, our emotions, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting. Mr. Neuhäuser? Yeah, I would like to <clears throat> add something pertaining to the um, teaching assistance, because um, there is a, a, a linguist and now Professor Emeritus, um, Michael Byron is his name, University of Durham, and he studied the language assistance program over years and published books about this. and. Um, and did interviews with language assistants after they returned home, in this case to the UK. And then 10 years after he interviewed them again and, and tried to figure out how this assistance program influences the lives of these um, language assistants. And, and, and he found out that the language assistants doing their, their, their job in the classroom, they inadvertently kind of automatically unconsciously learn without even noticing it. They, they, they acquire linguistic, intercultural, and social linguistic skills by just um, doing their job. Um, so they, they, they also benefit a lot by doing this job. And even if those who don't go into a um, um, educational career and who end up in um, companies and, and, and offices and governments and so on, these um, formal language assistants also usually tend to, to, to to, to work in an uh, intercultural field or in international departments and intend to, to um, take, 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 take problems a bit easier, those intercultural problems, because they have kind of unconsciously learned how to deal with these situations with different cultures. And, and, and cultures getting more and more diverse, like, um, um, like, like Ben said, or like um, um, Alison said. You have um, um, Muslims in class, you have Croatians in Corinthia, you have the Slovene minority, there's a lot of different culture and so on. So, so it gets more and more diverse and this um, benefits um, um, the language assistants also a lot more with the mm -hmm. time. Uh, Mr. Fleck? Yes, I would like to add on that. It even helps, I mean, I have found that um, USDA students might also help to fight racism actually. 
because sometimes in classes you have the us against them problem, you know, like Austrian and the foreigners. Not at our school, thankfully, but we have these pro we have these problems. And now here is a foreigner who is um, a role model actually. And do people see that foreigner is not necessarily somebody who is uh, like an underdog or something like that? And this really helps to think or uh, to get away from this us and them thinking. I've heard about this. We just want to add it towards the economy, I would say. And it's a very great thing. Mm. I was just curious, Mr. Neuhauser, does the ministry have some criteria on whether to measure success of a program like the USTA program? Uh, how do you assess whether it works? <laughs> Well, there has not been um, a, a fully fledged evaluation of the program. This has never taken place. Um, what we have is um, we request the schools to give us reports on the language assistance. So we, so we get a, a big picture because we have reports dating back many, many years. And um, the language assistants themselves give feedback. And um, the Austrians going abroad They also give us um, reports, and so this is the kind of um, feedback we have. But there has not been a, um, 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 uh, a kind of a real uh, in-depth review about um, how the impact is. But it's a good idea. We might might think about this. Um, but as I've said before, and um, the demand is so high for, for language assistance, um, we could um, um, employ about yeah more than double uh, of them, and. Um, Problem is, um, it's Austria is a very it's a, it's a federal country, so we have nine different states and nine different school, um, local school administration. So every uh, local administration in every federal state decides which school receives a language assistant, and um, these schools um, change, of course, because um, we can't send an assistant to, to, to every school, and so we get a lot of phone calls, either in the ministry or in the Austrian Exchange Service. Uh, where the technical um, issues are handled, um, schools complaining, why don't we get one this year? And um, it's, 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 yeah, so um, just by seeing the, the feedback we get from schools and school teachers and the language assistants, um, same, um, it's a very positive feedback we get. Um, just this year, for instance, the corona, lots of um, uh, assistants could not work at school um, um, for, a, for a very long um, stretches of time because um, they were closed. There was um, distance learning and different countries have different regulations. Like, let's say Italy or Spain, for instance, um, allow um, assistance only to stay for one period. So you know, right. after one right. year, they have to go home. Uh -huh. So we asked uh, for exceptions. Uh, if the, uh, the Italian ministry would allow them to stay longer. We asked the Italians in Austria and um, all of the Italians said, 100%, we want to have a second year because it was so great. Right. And the Italians right. wouldn't let them. The Spanish right. were a bit uh, easier. So that a couple of but that's some um, of the feedback we get. Right, thanks. Uh, just to get, uh, I see we're already nearing the time when we're going to take questions. So to everybody in the audience, please uh, post your questions in the Q&A section and we're going to get back to them. Uh, before we do that, though, I'd like to ask one more thing um, about, because you already said that the um, focus of the um, USTA program obviously has a limit too. How does it dovetail with the other programs uh, under the Fulbright roof uh, in the more academic field? What could be possible next steps for this But to keep this uh, process of mu uh, uh, fostering mutual understanding alive, um, uh, Mrs. Mose, probably you could chime in here. <clears throat> sure, I'm happy to say a few words. So, of course, Fulbright is a is a big program, and one of the wonderful flexibilities is that you can be a teaching assistant and still apply for one of the other um, programs. Um, so you you know, come back to Austria, uh, go back to the United States, um, be in one of the um, scholar programs. Um, but it's, uh, I would have to say, I mean, I'm, I, I want to put in a huge plug for 
Fulbright, obviously, and to continue with that program uh, when that's possible. But I think one of the really open doors about the USTA program is that um, there's so many other exchange programs that uh, are available as well. As I said before, it's um, I think the, the positive effect lasts a lifetime. So, I mean, there have been studies done on um, you know, it was mentioned before the intercultural understanding um, going into um, into a business environment where that benefit uh, of having been abroad um, makes a huge, huge difference. Um, it, again, it depends on what direction you're going to, but um, there are other exchange programs. Uh, not just by the, the US government. I mean, we're celebrating 70 years of Fulbright, um, but the International Visitor Leadership Program is another avenue uh, that may be possible. Um, there are um, abroad programs uh, once you decide to study abroad. I think that's also inspiring to a lot of um, USTAs um, to you know, spend more time in that country. Um, getting a degree. Um, so there are lots of possibilities, I think, at stages throughout life um, to use the skills that um, that were gained and to stay in touch and to, um, you know, make new friends and volunteer work. Um, I've met Americans who have taught abroad and um, it, it gave their life a whole new dimension uh, working with NGOs or working with schools um, back in the United States. So I really do see the, the possibilities as being endless, even though, of course, um, I do hope that people consider the, the Fulbright program after they've completed their, their USTA. Right. Uh, Mr. Ait, do you okay. want to see? If I, might, if I might follow up on that and also put the Austrian side in, in the perspective. So what we see is like the USTA program also for our Austrians as a kind of a starting point of the full body life cycle, so to say. So in other words, uh, in, the, in the Austrian school classes, Austrian students get first time, some of them even get first time exposure to the US culture and the first time interaction within US citizen. And then they think about maybe studying in the US or having a, a month abroad, an exchange abroad. And then maybe they you know, think about applying and studying, doing a master's via the Fulbright program abroad, or later on then meet a professor in university who is a Fulbright scholar, maybe a former USA coming back to Austria, uh, and thereby this starts the Fulbright life cycle. And then Austrians having this experience in the Fulbright program come back, um, and their kids go to school and their kids might again meet a USDA in the classroom, a teaching assistant, and thereby this life cycle is continued and continued. So for us, it has an effect on the US culture and the US TAs going back to the United States with the experience here in Austria as a cultural ambassador for Austria. And as well, the inspiration for Austrian, Austrian students taking then maybe the step to cross the big pond and go to the United States and get changed there. So that's, that's the next step for the people after the program, the students as well as the USAs from my side. Right, right. Uh, Mr. Ellis, do you have any uh, ideas or probably plans? Uh, uh, what your what your relationship to Austria is going to look like in the coming years, maybe? Um, well, hopefully it'll be permanent and lasting. Um, it has been so far. Um, yeah, I definitely feel like I can speak on the value of the program and you know, the connection that we build with the country and the community. Um, particularly one thing just to talk about how the USTAs are val valuable really quick. Um, I feel that when you have a extended experience learning to speak a new language and you pick up on that um, directly, especially with one individual or one teacher, um, that can really stick with you. Um, and for me, that is something that I know personally, having been an exchange student with Rotary to Austria in my high school years. Um, that's when my whole connection to Austria started. And that's what fueled me wanting to come back and to sort of give back to the educational community 
Um, Cause I'm from a small town in the Midwest where the idea of having a native speaker in the classroom or access to that is really, really limited and pretty much non-existent on um, the US side. And so for me, it was the opportunity to live with Austrian families as a 17 year old. Um, you know, I remember how from my host mother Helga or from my host brother Toby, like, you know, I, I remember what they taught me in German. Uh, realistically, that's something that, you know, uh, built my vocabulary and, you know, stays with me. Um, so when I tried to apply for a second year to teach, I really wanted to stay at the same schools. And I'm happy that that worked out because for me, that impact is the sort of sustainable learning, you know, the, the consistent presence in the classroom um, that we hopefully can offer. And so I think that's something that's excellent. I really applaud both Fulbright and the you know, ministry in Austria for having you know, this goal in mind for you know, decades to have the students, uh, the student teachers there um, to keep the language alive in the classroom. Um, going forward for me really quickly, I don't wanna to talk too long. Um, I plan on you know, hopefully one day returning to Austria more in a diplomatic context. Um, we shall see what happens there, but um, I'm leaving now to go and start my master's at the School of Foreign Service um, back in Washington, D.C. in Georgetown. And I'll be studying transatlantic uh, relations. So that means that I will continue this uh, sort of study of you know, how Austria and the U.S. are intertwined. And I think for me, that'll be permanent. So um, maybe one day I'll be working with the U.S. or with Austria in a different context. And mm. that's all I hope for. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. I, I... I think it really, I can testify to that as well, that uh, uh, you uh, develop really a strong relationship over, uh, over such a program. Um, I think uh, we should uh, get into the space where we take some questions. Um, there has been one uh, in the, in the earlier in the discussion um, <clears throat> that um, was quite um, interesting. As uh, Mr. Steinbichler asked, what were the most surprising stereotypes about the US held by students, if any, and how could they be clarified? This was directed at the TAs, uh, but probably uh, the teachers and uh, other people with experience in the field or uh, can, can uh, add their perspective to that. Um, Mrs. Gilmore, what were the, what were the cliches that you encountered? when you first came here? Yes, um, I think one of the cliches was that America is dangerous. And I think my students felt more comfortable with talking to me about that as a black woman, especially coming right out of Black Lives Matter. So of course my students are asking me, is America really that dangerous? Are people really this racist? And um, I actually was approached with a similar question on an exchange tour in 2014 in Germany. And I'm like, man, you know, this is one of the reasons why I'm in this program to remind people like, you know, there are good sides and bad sides to every coin. But I think the cliche of America being dangerous was one of them, especially coming from St. Louis, Missouri. This is also something that, you know, I'm not afraid to talk about. Um, that and also just us being really nice. Um, ben and I were having a little side chat about Midwest nice which is a different level of like even past Southern hospitality going into, you know, you drop off some sugar to your neighbor and it turns into a one hour conversation because nobody's too nice to say goodbye. <laughs> so yeah. that's another huge stereotype um, that I like to touch on with my students as well. I might add on to what Allison's talked about too. Um, really quickly, because I think part of that question was how do we confront the stereotype? Um, and I think for some things like talking about the reality of America, talking about maybe the dangers of America, things where I feel like it's our job to be as transparent as possible. Um, you know, I, I don't think, you know, we want to stand up there and, you know, and try to take the conversation in a different way. We don't want to turn away from those uh, issues. But I think, I mean, from my end, you know, as a you know midwesterner like i have tried to talk to my kids about how much you know what americans are doing to sort of act in their communities and act on these issues um because i've i've heard from students and teachers um even non-english teachers just other teachers in school recently i heard you know 
yeah, America's, you know, so beautiful. The parks, everything are so great. So I was teaching on some of those things you can go and travel to and see in the U.S. But they said, I think I'll wait to go to the U.S. until things calm down for, you know, a few years. And what that leaves me feeling, you know, is kind of like I, I want people to understand the reality of the country, but to understand, um, you know, how much people stand with their community and what people are doing, you know, in community organizing as well. Um, and how we approach issues that divide us too. So, because Americans tend to be of the mindset of talking about their opinions and having that exchange. So I definitely try to uh, impress upon my students how, you know, yeah, we, you know, we actively see these, uh, these issues and we try to engage in them too. Um, and especially, you know, with the Austrian community as well. So, um, and yeah, there's the stereotype too, okay, of course, of the superficial, make a friend easy with an American kind of thing, you know? Um, but I really like to, I, I think the Austrians can understand because Austria seems to have what I feel as a Midwesterner as a similar small town culture. I've never really lived in Vienna. I know it's uh, different than the rest of the country in some ways, bigger city vibes, but I'm familiar with a form of Austria, small towns and, you know, the Dorf Leben and the villages where people know each other, families know each other. Um, and so I think that's something that Americans and Austrians, if you point it out to each other, you can kind of uh, come to common terms there, um, which is awesome. Mr. Neuhauser, you uh, had your hand up. Yeah, I was um, just, just before you were just um, talking about um, what the next steps could be. So that was the reason why I raised my hand. It was just um, thinking um, <clears throat> that um, one might think if personnel is there and the, and the budget is there that one might think about networking a bit more after the, after returning back home. Um, uh, the Austrian Cultural Forum in London, for instance, has just started an initiative just recently, a couple of weeks ago. They want to get in touch with all the British assistants coming back from Austria this year, to get in touch and see and then and, and network a little bit. We have, we have a cultural forum in Washington, D.C. at the Austrian Embassy, plus an Office of Science and Technology, which is very, uh, you know, it has lots of expertise and networking, um, especially with researchers and scholars, but these two offices cooperate, and so there might be um, a space there to, to, to kind of um, cooperate with Fulbright in the United States to, to, to network. Um, the, the USTA is returning, so they can exchange and um, stay in contact. Right. Can I just uh, follow up with with uh, one other question from the audience? Um, uh, uh, Mrs. Askin Axon is, is is asking. Uh, uh, applying for Fulbright may not be something that a lot of undergrad students in the U.S. may be thinking about. They uh, don't, many don't have a global perspective of the opportunities available uh, to them. Uh, uh, I wonder what kind of outreach initiatives might be possible to motivate students to apply. Would returning Fulbrighters consider sharing their experiences with current undergraduates? So the question is probably about, you know, how to reach uh, students in the U.S. who may not even know of this opportunity. So thank you for that. Um, indeed, I think outreach is a really important um, um, activity with regard to the Fulbright program in general, but in addition also to the um, teaching assistantship program, which is uh, active in um, other countries, not just in the US, but with Fulbright Austria in the US. So that's definitely something which, which we are currently preparing for. The US Fulbright uh, community has, um, for example, including IE, ECA, and all these <coughs> stakeholders in the US, they have outreach activities for um, for the Fulbright program. And in addition to that, we are um, starting for the US teaching assistantship program to increase also the outreach there. So that's definitely something we are looking into, especially as everything is getting digitalized. So we have all these new tools available where, for example, we have we hosted um, in our virtual castle here in Austria, um, our, our uh, seminars and so on. So there will be new opportunities out there and uh, just keep your, you know, just watch out on our social media channels uh, to see what's happening there. And we will, I'm sure we will see each other. And just to uh, a shout out to all the 
4,000 US teaching assistants we have um, had in our program, so to say. So over 4,000 alums in the US uh, have had, a, had the pleasure to be part of this uh, USTA program. You will never you know, get rid of us. You are always part of our community and we are um, reaching out to you um, to get you active and promote the program. Just mm -hmm. keep in mind that you are part of a global community of teaching assistants. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mrs. Smaga, I just wanted to ask you from the other perspective, because you, you've been uh, on the receiving end of this uh, program, so to say, um, what, um, how has your re relationship to the States changed and would you consider now that you've finished your uh, Matura uh, to take any steps in participating in some exchange programs too? Yeah, mm -hmm. I've had the uh, chance to spend one summer in the US and I dearly miss it. I think it's such a great opportunity. Uh, it was just one summer and I benefited so greatly from it. So I can only imagine what an entire year or more, um, how, how much it enriches my life. Yeah, and then speaking of those cliches, uh, what was your experience like? What cliches did you probably have in your own head or which ones did you... Um, um, that you encounter in your class before you had the, the experience with USTAs? Yeah, it was this very sharp contrast of the things that were already mentioned. So on one hand, the US seems like a very dangerous place somehow, mm -hmm. but also what I love most about it, it seems to be the place that brings up the most feminists and activists and just very unapologetically outspoken people, which I admire, admire very much about it. So those are the two very uh, contrast, uh, cr contrasted cliches. That's interesting, yes. In terms, uh, just also from the teachers, um, Mr. Fleck and Mrs. Hüttner, um, were uh, cultural cliches uh, and barriers in that sense ever an issue that you felt with uh, uh, as a, as a uh, potential obstacles between TAs and, and students, or how did you experience that? No, I didn't have, I never experienced any cliches like that. Um, there might have been one or the, the one or the other student who didn't take his, her job seriously. Yeah, that happened, didn't turn up or so, but we managed to get through with that and I was fine. It was the same as, um, yeah, a normal, there was no stereotype to be managed. Oh. Yeah. There was one. There was one. Now I come to think about it. Um, always, always um, the American students or teaching assistants rather, they were found to be cool. And this is a stereotype. Well, I don't know if it is one, but it always I always had to respond to the feedback that they are cool. Um, maybe we can um, conclude that Americans are cool generally, or maybe just the people who come to as USTAs. I don't know, but this is something that kept, um, yeah, kept occurring. Right, right, right. Are there any more questions from the audience at this point? I think we're ending uh where we're reaching the end of our scheduled time so, I might add to that. yes please yeah just to again to kind of talk about the impression that we might have of uh the americans and whatnot um as the american tears in the classroom i really make a point of kind of introducing a different uh like kind of classroom culture when it's my lesson time um you know, I mean, of course, there, there are aspects of Austrian school systems that come off as very formal to, from an American perspective, the, the respects given, the names given to the teachers, the standing up in front of the classroom, the attention, um, which are all great, you know, the, the, those are great things about the Austrian uh, culture in the classroom setting. However, you know, I think most of the TAs, you know, we don't necessarily see ourselves as teachers in the same level. Um, you know, we see, we kind of see ourselves as being younger. And so we step in there with this desire to be casual, informal, 
to, again, I think, um, you know, I mean, I, we talk about it because we want the students to notice it and feel that um, so that they feel comfortable talking, um, so that they're talking not to, you know, Herr Professor Hoffman as, you know, they're talking to Ben. And, you know, I've had kids just come up and talk to me too like that. So, yeah. I, mm -hmm. Mr. Fleck and then Mrs. Skoma. And what's also very important, you don't give grades. And if you yeah. make mistakes, you don't, even maybe you correct them, but it's not a bad thing. And teachers, well, it should not be the case. Teachers also help students correct them when they make mistakes. But it's something deep inside the students. Um, if I make a mistake in front of my teacher, well, it might be bad for me. And they feel more free talking to you. And anyway, mm -hmm. the teacher is always the same old teacher. I mean, no offense, man, but the student is a new person. This is always a very interesting and good thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, just, I don't know, uh, probably some people might be watching who uh, have an interest into applying uh, for a USTA position in Austria themselves. Um, Mrs. Gilmore and Mr. Ellis, uh, what would you uh, give them as a piece of advice? Or what would you think, what would you like to have known before probably? Uh, is there anything that... Uh... Um, I can think of a few things. Um, I think one piece of advice is to kind of do a bit of research on Austria. Um, my only experience prior to coming to Austria was on an exchange tour and I went to Salzburg. And I said, this is the most beautiful place I've ever seen. I have to come back. And now I'm back. And I came with the understanding of there will be a different dialect and it won't necessarily be Germany, but hate to offend any Austrians in the room. I thought it would be extremely similar. I was extremely wrong. <laughs> and I feel like my Austrian students and all the Austrians around me make it a point every day <laughs> to remind me how Austrian they are. And I extremely love it, you know, between Servus, Scott, like things that you do not hear out in Dortmund, in Dusseldorf, you know, those things that really remind you of the differences in culture, that you're coming into this with this German classroom experience, probably learning the language, maybe learning some things about Freud and so on, but the actual culture immersion of Austria is so different. That and be ready to ski. That is my two pieces of advice. <laughs> yeah, that's real. Um, I would add on top of this, uh, for anyone considering applying, wondering if it's the right fit for you, especially if you maybe have an interest in teaching, but you don't have that manifested in the term uh, context of like, maybe you're not studying teaching, you don't know if you'll ever actually pursue it directly, do this job. Why? Because it's like the best shot for you in a really unique setting to kind of test out your teaching chops, practice that, um, get the exposure in the classroom. Um, you know, I don't know if I'll find myself in the classroom again in the future, but um, I love the whole teaching context. And, you know, maybe it's just the Austrian schools, you know, it's a, it's a unique environment, but that's kind of part of the, the, the awesomeness to it. And of course, you know, I can um, underline that difference, right? There's a different cultural uh, context that you're entering going to Austria as opposed to Germany. Um, but for anyone looking into applying, I just, it's, it's kind of the shot in the dark that you need to take. Um, because I think that those, if, if you're motivated and you show that in your application, it's a very accessible goal. Most of the times, American university students, uh, their university, their study abroad department, or if they have, a, say, a German department, will have contacts and maybe former, like a student alumni and uh, that they can get in touch with to help them in the application or just help them like learn about the program. So usually the university itself can be the, you know, um, nexus point to connect them to Fulbright and USTA Austria. But it's just, it, it's definitely just the step worth taking. And, you know, I think if anyone is listening in and thinks, you know, I don't know, can I do it? Will I get accepted? Take the shot. Um, you have good odds and, you know, just make the most of it. So capitalize on that, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I think we're already past our scheduled time. So uh, if anybody wants to add something to this, please raise your hand now. Um, 
otherwise I would call, oh, Ms. Gummer. <laughs> I hate to hold us over, but I really just want to give a huge shout out to Mr. Agus and also um, Mr. Sims, who prefers me to call him Mitch. Really, this has been a, a wonderful program, and I'm so excited to share with everybody and really have all of us here to be able to share our experiences across these. So thank you once again for having this program. Thank you very much. And I... Um, uh, and my thanks in ha having me here as a moderator, oh, I mean, Herman, uh, there's, yeah, uh, Mr. Agis, you, you were doing the closing statement, right? So um, thank you all uh, for, for being part of this. Um, you, uh, Michael Huber, for being our moderator and getting the entire framework here in place that we are, that we can talk and don't shout at each other. So it's great that this happened. And um, I want to thank all of you who uh, joined this panel today for your time and energy, especially the young bright minds, uh, the USTAs as well as the students. I also would like to thank the Austrian Ministry of Education, Science and Research uh, for funding the USTA program and the Austrian government as well as the US government for funding the Fulbright program, because uh, without um, the embassy and all the stakeholders, the Fulbright commission would not exist to be able to uh, facilitate this program, the USDA program here in the Austrian classrooms. So without all of you, this would not be possible. And my final, my final remarks go to uh, the team of Fulbright Austria here. Um, I want to thank Doné Johnson, as well as Sophie Thiel for managing as program officers here in the commission, the program itself. Um, Mitch for organizing this panel discussion uh, for our 70 years of Right Mind celebration and everybody who is part of the Fulbright community. Without you, this would not be possible. So with this, I hand over for the last words to you, Michael. Okay, uh, I was getting ahead of myself, I'm sorry. Uh, no, uh, I only wanted to uh, add, add my thanks uh, to for having me here as a moderator and uh, for getting the chance to get to know you all. I hope um, we can meet in person at one time or another. And um, I'm looking forward to doing that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. See you on June 10th.